Indonesia's second president, Suharto, came to power in 1967 amid a period of crisis and bloodshed. 32 years later, he was forced out in a similar fashion. Pemerintahan Pak Harto adalah pemerintahan yang otoriter, militeristik, dan korup. On 21st May 1998, Indonesia's President Suharto resigned from office amidst massive street protests and political turmoil. Because of the mood at the time, he was treated as a pariah, as a political pariah. No one would want to go near him. Today, many Indonesians are yearning for the good old days of Suharto. Sebelum tahun belakangan muncul semacam kerinduan akan uh, masa jaya Orde Baru. On the 20th anniversary of the fall of Suharto, has the passage of time softened the image of this Indonesian strongman? Was he really a hero or a villain? Twenty years since the fall of Suharto, much has changed. Just outside the presidential palace in Indonesia's capital, Jakarta, a small group of protesters gather to vent their anger and frustration at the government. This public display of defiance was almost unheard of 20 years ago. For 32 years, Suharto ruled Indonesia with an iron fist. Political dissent was not tolerated. 65-year-old Maria Sumarse has been protesting here every week for the last 10 years. Her 21-year-old son, Wawan, who was then a student at Atma Jaya University, was shot dead by the military during the 1998 anti-Suharto protest. Pada saat itu, uh, Wawan uh, uh, apa, ada, ada tentara yang masuk ke dalam kampus Atma Jaya, kemudian ada korban jatuh, Wawan memberitahukan kepada tentara, itu ada korban boleh ditolong atau tidak. Uh, ketika tentara itu memberi tahukan mem, apa memberi izin ya silahkan ditolong Wawan mengeluarkan bendera putih dari dalam tasnya yang berisi obat-obatan uh, dilambe-lambekan sebagai tanda untuk memberikan pertolongan pada saat Wawan akan mengangkat uh, korban Wawan ditembak. Nah ini uh, menurut hasil otopsi Wawan ditembak dengan peluru tajam standar Abri entah tentara entah polisi uh, di dada sebelah kiri mengenai jantung dan parunya. Suharto's bloody legacy began more than 50 years ago. Indonesia then was on the brink of political, social and economic collapse due to the failed policies of its first president, Sukarno. A botched coup led to an anti-communist purge. It is estimated that half a million people were killed. The events of 1965 marked the start of Suharto's new order regime. One of Suharto's main priorities then was to revive the country's ailing economy. With no sound economic policies in place prior to 1967, the Indonesian economy went into freefall. Suharto knew then that he needed to take some drastic actions. He turned to his team of economists to help stem the slide. Emil Salim was among those tasked with the responsibility of pulling Indonesia out of its economic doldrums. When you have inflation, get to the source inflation. And that's the budget. The budget was but excessive with a high deficit to control the deficit, point one. Point two, you have a balance of payment problem. The export was very low, the import was very high, and the debt was very high. So the balance of payment issue. But, but how can you settle this? Suharto was focusing on three major issues. Stabilization first, stabili stability in economics, finance, and so stability in the political affairs. Second, in the case of development, 
compartment so that we can have rehabilitation and to development. And third is equity, uh, to cope with the poverty, which was very clear at the time that the people were suffering, lack of food, lack of services, lack of water, lack of everything. So stability, development, and equity. While his team of economists formed one half of his new order regime, the other half was consolidated under his political party, Golkar. Golkar was an obscure military-run federation of NGOs that was transformed by Suharto into his electoral vehicle. Dui Fung Si, or dual function, was the term coined to describe the military's intrusion into the domestic political arena. It was a transition from the Sukarno era yeah, into a more development-oriented uh, uh, politics. And uh, so he was managing the transfer, Paharto. Pa and he had a lot of uh, challenge from within. It was not easy for him. So he really needed a political arm in order to function. With the help of the military, Suharto outlawed all leftist political parties. It clamped down on freedom of expression and democracy. It banned all publications relating to the communist purge. Suharto's government also used the country's secular national ideology, Panchasila, to suppress political dissent and curbed the influence of Islamist groups to ensure little or no opposition to his rule. Sarwono Kusumaat Macha was then the former Secretary General of Golka. He was among those offered a job by Suharto to advance his vision for Indonesia. Well, I was recruited in 1970 to join Golkar uh, by the uh, armed forces. Yeah. And the choice at that time was either I join Golkar or I would end up in a military jail. And uh, so I tried to find out what the jail was like. And I didn't like uh, what I heard about it because uh, it was full of cockroaches and worms and all that. So I thought uh, being a parliamentarian would be a better choice. So I signed up. I was there for 17 years. The first time I met him was in 1983. But he knew about me. And actually, I was his choice to be the first civilian secretary general of Golkar. And uh, I only found out about it later. And uh, I met him the first time in my life was in 1983. And uh, he was an impressive uh, person here yeah, because he projected uh, dignity and authority. And he really had a command of things. Uh, in my view at that time. Suharto had built the foundations of an authoritarian government which would allow his reign to continue for an unprecedented 32 years. But this stranglehold on power also caused the country to suffocate. When President Suharto first took over the country's leadership, he inherited a country that was teetering on a verge of collapse. Its per capita income stood at only $70, and 60% of the population lived in poverty. With foreign debt of around 2.4 billion US dollars and a rapidly declining rupiah, President Suharto knew he had to do something to turn the economy around. We have a high rate of inflation. The import is much higher than export. The debt was, foreign debt was very high. Practically speaking, Indonesia economy was bankrupt. Suharto's authoritarian rule helped bring political stability back to the country. The influence of the military was pervasive. It permeated throughout almost every level of the Indonesian society. By 1969, 70% of Indonesia's provincial governors and more than half of his district chiefs were active military officers. Even parliamentary seats were reserved for military officers 
in line with the concept of Dui Fung Si, or dual function, which gave the military power both in national defense and domestic politics. Former General Andrea Tono Sutarto had close contact with Suharto, being the then commander of the Presidential Guard in Suharto's final year in office. Suharto itu punya prinsip untuk bisa membangun negara ini, termasuk membangun ekonomi, maka diperlukan adanya stabilitas. Nah, stabilitas itu antara lain tidak boleh terjadi gejolak politik, tidak boleh terjadi gejolak apapun untuk bisa membuat agar supaya bangsa ini bisa membangun, fokus membangun, dan itu bisa terjadi. Nah, dalam angka stabilitas itu, maka diperlukanlah tindakan yang kita sekarang sebutnya itu sebagai otoritarian. For more than three decades, Suharto ruled Indonesia with an iron fist, suppressing dissent and silencing all opposition. With his firm control, he was able to put Indonesia's economy back on track. It grew at an average of 7% annually. In less than 10 years, inflation dropped from 660% to 19%. Indonesia was transformed from an agricultural backwater into an Asian economic miracle. The new order was uh, more authoritarian government, all right? But uh, in a sense, more effective government too. So in a decade, over a decade, we transform ourselves from the largest importer of rice to be self-sufficient in rice. And what surprised the world was not just that, but in the process, the world had never witnessed such a rapid decline in rural poverty. So there was uh, authoritarian government and uh, all this democracy was again much more informed than in substance. And what I would say at that time was you had a mafia style of uh, management, that everybody was forced to be corrupt. So nobody could do any finger pointing. His closest friends, military figures, and top technocrats were the key beneficiaries. Together, they controlled lucrative business under Suharto's sponsored crony capitalism, while his children acquired assets worth billions of dollars. Aid and investments also came pouring in, thanks to his close links with Western powers and his staunchly anti-communist stance during the Cold War era. That helped foster rapid economic growth and advance his ambitious, but often economically unsound development projects, bringing in greater fortunes to his cronies. Even though it was an openly corrupt system, Indonesia prospered economically under his leadership. Yusril Iza Mahendra, who was then a young political activist, was asked to become Suharto's speechwriter. He knew the workings of the Suharto government well. I think corruption is a system. Tidak di zaman Parto, di zaman sekarang pun korupsi banyak sekali, bahkan mungkin lebih banyak dari zaman Parto. Selama sistem tidak dibenahi, selama itu korupsi akan selalu ada. Ya, misalnya sekarang orang uh, pilkada secara langsung, ya pilkada langsung itu membuka pintu terjadinya korupsi. Tapi ya kita suka pilkada langsung. Saya dari dulu tidak mau ada pilkada langsung. As Indonesia's economy grew. Suharto promoted the brightest minds. Emil Salim, a member of the Berkeley Mafia, was promoted to the Ministry of Environment. Emil found himself in an unusual spot. From driving the economy as an economist, he now had to drive new growth through his new ministry. I understand the forestry minister, in order to provide funds, you have to cut the trees. But from the environment point of view, you cut the environment. So conflicts, um, especially on the environment issues, with resource exploitation is a big issue. It's being settled within there. Suharto saw the potential of Indonesia's abundant natural resources to the economy. By 1979, Indonesia became the leading producer of logs, contributing to about 40% of the global market. The forests were the second largest contributor to the national economy after oil. By the early 90s, Emil had spent more than 20 years in the Suharto government, and it was time to call it quits. 
he called me in 93. It was in March. He was creating a second cab the cabinet in after 93. And he said, we have been together since 73, since 68 and so on. So, but this time, uh, you will not be in the cabinet, he said, yeah, 93. And so I really, I was really, frankly, honestly relieved. I told him, Mr. President, I'm relieved that I'm not be assigned anymore. Because if you have 25 years since 73, do, continuously being an official, then you have no freedom. You, you cannot be free. And uh, your family life is a little bit um, um, number two. And so, so I'm relieved that I mean, I, now I can be back to becoming a normal man. Unexpectedly, he said, I feel the same way, he said. It's time for me to quit. It's too long, 25 years, 68, 93. Emil thought that after 27 years in power, President Suharto would do the same. Then I thought he was taking a decision to him, but apparently he said he leave it, he will talk it over with the political uh, leaders too the army and the gold car. And we had a meeting. I was attending, also invited in the meeting. And he mentioned the, the gold car chairman stood it up, he said, give us time to check whether the public agree with your resignation, with your being no president anymore. So a kind of a survey. So the military supported that idea also. And well, okay, I have to say, okay. Now, after a few months, the report of the survey came. 93% want him not to quit. So, can you imagine, yeah, when he feels that your party, the party Golkar and then the Abri, are telling him that the public opinion is that he should not resign. What should your reaction be? Your personal interest or your interest to the nation. Suharto was blindsided by a questionable poll presented to him by his own party, Golkar. There was also another glaring problem. Golkar was built around the idea that the party would continue to re-elect him indefinitely. There was no succession plan. He's a human at the end. Uh, he's getting old. Uh, the question of regeneration is being discussed in 1996, uh, 1997. Uh, uh, the situation is getting worse. Question come into a different ways. Um, question on how to to uh, to change uh, who repre uh, will replace Suharto. How to change? Do we need a reform? Even Suharto talk about the reform itself. The reform, according to him, should be slowly by slowly. Uh, but the question is, who will guard the reform processes? For how long? As questions were being raised about his political future, the 1997 financial crisis hit the region. Foreign investors lost confidence in Asian economies and pulled out their funds from the region. The Indonesian currency collapsed after coming under attack by currency speculators. A banking crisis which ensued caused many companies to go under. Indonesian GDP fell by 15%. People lost their jobs and poverty levels soared. It could not have come at a worse time for Suharto. As dissatisfaction grew, the public went to the streets to vent their anger against Suharto and his wealthy cronies. By the end of 1997 and early 1998, student groups began to stage street protests demanding his resignation. Di sisi lain, uh, saya melihat ada tekanan besar yang bisa barangkali mengganggu keselamatan presiden dan keluarganya. Tapi sisi lain saya tahu bahwa tuntutan itu ada benarnya dan mereka adalah adik-adik kita, saudara-saudara kita. Tapi saya tidak bisa melepaskan tugas saya sebagai seorang yang bertanggung jawab terhadap keselamatan presiden dengan dengan keluarganya. It is not easy, you know. 
<laughs> very difficult for me. Tetapi itu hal realita yang saya hadapi. Saya harus mengambil pilihan. Bahwa saya tetap dengan sumpah saya untuk menjaga presiden dengan seluruh keluarganya. Tapi sisi lain saya instruksikan kepada seluruh anggota saya. Apapun yang terjadi sejauh mungkin hindari terjadinya korban. Sebab mereka itu adalah saudara-saudara kita juga. Mereka itu anak-anak kita juga. With tensions rising, Suharto made a trip to Egypt. Back at home, events began to unravel. On 13th May 1998, four students were shot during a protest at Trisakti University. So the crackdown uh, happened at 5 p.m. Then the student uh, came inside after the shooting. Uh, hundreds of them, or even thousands, they were running crazily, the police and the military. They were lining up with their gun on the bridge, and they were shooting toward the student. Suharto cut his trip short and returned home. Behind closed doors, the political scales began to shift. It was clear Suharto no longer had the backing of his cabinet ministers. A letter that was shown to Yusriel by the chairman of Golkar clearly indicated that Suharto's days were numbered. Akbar Tanjung buka ini baju jaketnya berat gitu, pakai zip gitu ya. Kasih ini suratnya, menteri-menteri mundur. Nah, jadi saya buka surat itu hanya kopinya. Saya pulang ke jalan Cendana. Saya bilang sama Pak Sida, Pak Sida. Kita ketemu presiden sekarang. Hmm. Jadi kami ketok-ketok kamar Pak Arto, Pak Arto keluar. Saya pakai, uh, kalau nggak salah pakai sarung begitu. Jadi saya berdua dengan Pak Arto, uh, dengan uh, Sadilah, Pak Arto keluar. Itu untung ada fotonya. Saya panggil juga di foto. Itu itulah pertemuan terakhir saya dengan uh, Pak Arto malam itu. Jadi uh, saya bilang Pak, ternyata. Menteri-menteri mundur itu betul. Kamu tahu dari mana dia? Ini saya dapat suratnya dari Akbar Tanjung. Terus Pak Tol lihat. Dia bilang, kalau sudah begini, ya sudah besok saya mundur. Kamu siapkan bagaimana berhentinya. Ini presiden sudah 32 tahun jadi presiden. Tiba-tiba malam itu mau berhenti dan suruh saya ngurusin bagaimana berhentinya. Saudara bisa bayangkan saya Pak Tol itu baru umur 30 tahun lebih ya. Harus mengatasi keadaan seperti ini. On 21st May 1998, Suharto, father of Indonesia's development, read his final speech. Untuk menyatakan berhenti dari jabatan saya sebagai Presiden Republik Indonesia. Jadi akhirnya semua uh, berakhir, Pak Arto berhenti dan saya lihat Pak Arto datang ke istana uh, senyum-senyum begitu. Tidak ada kelihatan uh, marah, tidak ada kelihatan uh, Ragu-ragu atau enggak. Bacakan pidato itu mantap saya berdiri di situ. Pak Arto bacakan. Dan setelah itu <coughs> Pak Habibie langsung dilantik. Dan salaman. Terus Pak Arto langsung turun dari istana. Saya liatin mobilnya. Itulah yang terakhir. Jadi eh, setelah itu ya Pak Arto udah. Tidak pernah lagi uh, kembali ke istana. But was that the end of Indonesia's troubles? On 21st May 1998, Indonesia's Vice President Baharudin Yusof Habibi was sworn in as the president of the world's fourth most populous nation. He took over from Suharto, who was forced to resign amid the country's worst economic and political crisis. Suharto's resignation brought joy and relief for thousands of protesters who called for an end to his 32 years of authoritarian rule. But the euphoria was short-lived. Soon, protesters turned their anger at President Habibi was still seen as being part of Suharto's new order regime. They demanded a total reform of the system and regarded the political change following the handover power to President Habibi as merely superficial. Soon after, 
the chaos continued. We need to remember when Suharta stopped the power, stopped from the power. It doesn't mean that the 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 bright, the bright, the shining light is just coming like that. No. Haris Azhar is a lecturer, lawyer, and former head of NGO Contrast. Contrast's primary mission is to assist victims of human rights violations in Indonesia. He witnessed the difficulties Indonesia faced as it evolved from an authoritarian rule to a democracy. It was a transition marked by violence and chaos. We had so many terrors, fake news. We were bombed, our office being attacked. That was the first five years of tran uh, democratic transitions. On the morning of 14th May, 1998, Maria Sanu's 16-year-old son, Stevanus, died at a mall in East Jakarta. It happened at the time when mass violence, riots, and civil unrest broke out in many parts of Indonesia. An estimated 1,000 people died here during the melee. Every year, Maria comes to this mall to remember and grieve over her son's death 20 years ago. Saya setiap tanggal 13 Mei tabur bunga dan doa bersama di Tropkat ini untuk mengenang peristiwa tragedi Mei 98 di Jogja Plaza Klender ini sekarang berganti Mall Citra. Dari jam 7 sampai jam 8 langsung ke Pondok Rangon tabur bunga dan doa bersama pula di kuburan masal Pondok Rangon. Tanggal 13 hari yang sama. Trauma aja. Kalau mengingat itu jadi The government had lost all control as rampant violence and mass looting spread across the country. Stefanus was trapped inside this mall when it was set alight by rioters. Tapi kalau memang ini anak betul-betul, dia tidak pulang karena dibakar, mohon diampuni segala dosanya. Hanya ibu doa dua alternatif itu untuk nggak adanya Stefanus ini. Tapi bayangan ibu, selalu ibu kalau bilang anak saya dibakar hidup-hidup. Itu perbuatan yang biadab tidak berperi kemanusiaan. Ini maaf ibu, jadi kalau ditanya sekitar panus pasti nangis. Karena ibu yang mengandung, melahirkan, merawat, sudah besar, dibakar begitu saja. Kalau jenazahnya diketemukan beda, kita melihat. Walaupun gosong-gosong, ini jenazahnya tidak diketemukan di kubur masal Pondok Rangon 113 makam di mana anak ibu-ibu tidak tahu. Karena satu peti itu menurut cerita ada yang delapan, kalau abu, kalau tulang mungkin enam. Maria Sanu is still trying to recover from her psychological trauma 20 years after her son's death. But for others, the violent clashes have left horrible scars. 58-year-old Iwan runs a Chinese herbal medicine shop. During the 1998 riots, Iwan was on his way home when he found himself caught in the middle of an angry mob. All of a sudden, things got out of hand. Ternyata begitu aku lihat, kok dalam perjalanan itu ada satu kelompok lalu ingin menghadang motor saya, lalu saya menghindar. Terus tepatnya di Pulau Gadung itu, dekat terminal, nggak lama, ada satu kelompok lagi. Dia ingin, uh, dia ingin mem mem menghadang motor saya lagi, lalu aku menghindar. Tepatnya di depan es time ponco sini, ada satu kelompok, kemudian nggak tahu gimana, kayak udah diatur. Setelah itu saya menghindar, Terus di, begitu saya menghindar, di depan ada satu kelompok lagi teman yang mereka yang pertama itu. Kemudian motor saya tinggalkan, lalu saya melarikan diri menuju ke arah gedung atrium Senen. Se, se, setelah itu saya lari dengan sekenceng-kencengnya, ke, ke, ternyata di hati ini nggak enak, ada apa ini. Lalu saya menengok ke arah belakang. Ternyata 20 orang ngejarin saya, terus salah satunya ada yang menarik lengan baju saya. Kemudian setelah ditarik, langsung nggak ditanya A, B, A, P, C lagi. Langsung membabi buta. Saya di, dari A dilempar ke C, saya lempar 
dari saya lempar ke D. Kemudian saya nggak tahan, lalu setelah digebukin, kemudian saya posisi saya jatuh seperti kalau orang tidur gini. Lalu setelah dijatuh di seperti orang tidur, lalu seluruh tubuh badan saya itu diinjek-injek. Kemudian kuping mulut hidung warin darah. Ya pikiran mati deh nggak nyangka hidupnya ini. Saya berserah semua sama Tuhan ya. Setelah itu, kemudian bensin motor saya itu baru isi penuh. Lalu dimandiin tuh satu tangki, kurang lebih 6 liter. Nah, dimandiin sampai habis tuh, kemudian saya dibakar. Pada saat dibakar, kemudian saya pingsan. Pingsan total. When Iwan came around, he found himself on the hospital bed, nursing his wounds. Setelah masuk gawat darurat, setengah jam kemudian sadar. Begitu sadar ininya, begitu saya lihat ini daging pada kem nggak ada, tinggal tulang ini. Ini bekas ini yang belang-belang tuh, diambil kiri kanan diambil, lalu sebagian dari belakang, nah, dicangkok lagi. Nah. Nah, terus ini mengangkat patah. Ini masih pakai pen nih bu. Masih pakai pen ini saya belum cabut. Nah, terus kuping mulut hidung warin darah, lalu dokter mengatakan, lalu ini harapan hidup Pak Iwan saat ini 0%. persen. Terus, nah, terus saya, lalu dokter mengatakan biasa pembuluh da dari kuping mulut hidung warin darah mati, menandakan pembuluh darah pecah. Kenapa Pak Iwan bisa hidup? Lalu saya bilang apa sama dokternya? Ini kebesaran Tuhan yang terjadi pada diri ya. saya, mujizat Tuhan. In the aftermath of the events of 1998, some of the Indonesian military officers were put on trial for the deaths of protesters, including students. Although military personnel were convicted, the higher-ranked officers and generals were spared. Setiap Kali ada pelanggaran yang itu masuk dalam pelanggaran hukum, tentu harus kita lakukan tindakan hukum. Tetapi kalau ada masalah-masalah seperti itu, lalu kita hanya bergulat untuk menyelesaikan permasalahan itu yang saya yakin sangat itu tidak akan bisa memuaskan semua pihak. Bahkan mungkin akan menjadi lebih meruncing lagi. Karena saya barangkali setuju dengan apa yang menjadi eh, keputusan untuk menyelesaikan masalah itu. Belum tentu itu setuju oleh oleh yang lain. Belum tentu itu setuju oleh keluarga dari mereka-mereka yang menjadi korban. Belum tentu setuju oleh mereka-mereka yang dituduh melakukan pelanggaran itu. Sementara bangsa ini harus terus maju ke depan. After Suharto's fall from power, efforts were made to charge Suharto with human rights violations and acts of corruption. Despite numerous attempts, he was never convicted. Suharto died 10 years after his resignation. But 20 years after the collapse of the new order regime, is Indonesia better off today than it was during the era of President Suharto? Suharto in 1998 ushered in a new beginning for Indonesia. From the authoritarian regime under the former president, the country embarked on a new phase known as reformasi or reformation. Where democracy and open liberal tradition became the centerpiece of its struggle. Since then, the country has had five presidents. BJ Habibie, Abdurrahman Wahid, or popularly known as Gus Dur, Megawati Sukarno Putri, daughter of Indonesia's first president Sukarno, and retired Army General Susilo Bambang Yudhoyono, who was elected in the country's first direct elections in 2004. Although the initial post Suharto era was marked by chaos and ethnic violence, economic and political stability returned during the eight year leadership of President Yudhoyono. Indonesia today has made tremendous progress under the leadership of President Joko Widodo or Jokowi. From a country that was on the cusp of becoming a failed state two decades ago, Indonesia is now a thriving democracy with a stable economy. The people also have considerable democratic rights and freedom, something which would have been unimaginable 20 years ago.
setelah reformasi 98, setelah Big Bang itu, kebebasan berekspresi juga ikut menjadi sebuah kejutan yang penting buat rakyat Indonesia. Kebebasan berbicara tiba-tiba tumbuh dengan sangat bersemangat pada waktu itu. Kritik terhadap pemerintahan, lalu juga komentar-komentar terhadap kekuasaan, itu tumbuh dengan sangat luar biasa dan muncul di hampir semua media. Indonesia continues to push forward as a modern nation, but not everyone is happy about it. Greater freedom and democratic rights have also led to the mushrooming of political parties. Today there's a different politics. In the past, there was Suharto. And you talk with Suharto, you decisions are taken and that will be that. Now it's difficult, different. You have a democracy, you have 14 political parties, now becoming 18 political parties. I always ask the question, what is the difference between the PDIP, the Democratic, and then the NASDEM, the Democratic Party, and then you have the Hanura, the Virantos Party. All are nationalist based. What is the difference between A, B, C, except the chairman? When A say this, is it reflecting ideology or is it reflecting interest? And then comes the idea, the goal, you have a direct election. And direct election is very expensive. And so you start wondering, how to get you money? There is something wrong in our system. It is not development oriented. It is oriented towards the development of the party, not ideology, person, personalities. So, so here I feel that I'm comfortable. The newfound freedom has also allowed radical voices to enter the political space. The Indonesian civil society has now been put on the defensive by radical and conservative Islamic elements which are pushing for their own agenda. The 2017 racially charged campaign that took down Jakarta's governor Basuki Cahaya Purnama, or better known by his nickname Ahok, reflected the growing influence of fundamentalist groups in Indonesia. There's some irresponsible politicians then who then exploit issues of religious extremism just to gain a, a position, you know, in the political arena. Then that's, for me, that's, that's, a, that's a, a threat for this nation. There are pockets of society that long for the return of the Suharto era because it reminds them of the 32 years of political and economic stability. Many still remember it as a time when goods and petrol were cheaper. The Indonesian rupiah was also far stronger compared to what it is today. I still remember how the, the, uh, the Minister of Information uh, come, uh, come to media in every regular time, announce how much is the price for, the, for everything, vegetables, uh, everything. And so Harto is very uh, the center of all the activities of the country. Um, on, on one hand, I think it was like, it seems like good. One of Indonesia's most pressing problems is corruption. So far, President Jokowi has been struggling to contain the problem. Just last month, an Indonesian court sentenced the former Speaker of Parliament and former chairman of the Golkar Party, Setia Novanto, to 15 years in prison. He was found guilty of stealing 170 million US dollars of public money in the Electronic Identity Card project. 80 other officials, legislators and businessmen were also implicated. I think one of my concerns for Indonesia is that uh, because of the, the, the level of corruption, that if you don't have it checked, it has the potential to stifle our uh, achievement in the future. It will create a sense of despair in people. And a sense of despair is very dangerous. It's a fertile ground to be exploited by the extremist groups. Uh, who offers uh, very uh, like uh, uh, quick remedy to a complicated problem? A lot of people said that oh, it's better to go back to the to the Suharto time. No, you cannot go back. 
they said uh, during Suharto time there was a corruptions, but it was controlled by Suharto. But today you have corruptions everywhere. They forgot that the corruption is not only about how much, but the ability of to do the crime. Who teach us to to be able to do this kind of stealing money? It's Suharto time. Maria Sumarse is still angry that individuals connected to Suharto's new order regime are still able to return to public life in spite of their checkered past. Jadi sekarang ini Orde Baru sudah kembali, sudah sudah berkuasa lagi. Kita melihatnya reformasi itu dibajak oleh kroni-kroni Suharto, dirusak oleh kroni-kroni Suharto. Sekarang kita bisa melihat Tommy anaknya Pak Harto yang dulu pernah ditahan, dia mendirikan partai berkarya dan sekarang dia lolos ikut pemilu eh, tahun 2019 nanti. Begitu juga Pak Wiranto yang diduga sebagai pelaku pelanggar HAM dalam tragedi penembakan para mahasiswa dalam kasus Trisakti Semanggi 1 dan 2, dia adalah yang diduga sebagai pelakunya, tetapi dia mendirikan partai politik, partai Hanura, dia ikut pemilu sejak tahun pemilu tahun kalau tidak salah pemilu 2004 itu sudah ada dan Pak Wiranto mencalonkan diri sebagai presiden tidak dia pilih rakyat kemudian mencalonkan diri sebagai wakil presiden dan sekarang diberi jabatan presiden Jokowi uh, sebagai Menko Polhukam A mature and functioning democracy is not built overnight but Indonesia's transition into a stable democracy has been one of the country's greatest achievements. Former President Suharto may cast a long shadow over the country. Sooner or later, he may be relegated to a mere footnote in the country's history or forgotten altogether. Well, I think the future in politics would be decided by the younger generation who has nothing to do with the past. They're starting to be interested in politics and doing things which are different yeah, from the elders. I hope that during the elections uh, next year, some of these newly established parties, by people uh, not having ties, whatever, in the past, would start to make an inroad. Menurut saya, adalah bahwa reformasi sudah menuju ke arah yang benar bahwa ada beberapa hal yang masih belum sesuai dengan apa yang yang diharapkan, yes, antara lain keadilan, kesejahteraan yang belum sepenuhnya, tetapi intinya kita sudah belajar jalan yang benar. Saya cukup optimistis melihat 20 tahun lagi Indonesia ke depan ya, dengan pengalaman transisi yang cukup berdarah-darah yang dialami oleh masyarakat Indonesia, itu membawa satu kesadaran yang kuat bahwa uh, Indonesia menjadi yang terdepan menyelesaikan proses transisi demokrasi yang sangat esensial di kawasan Asia, saya kira. Dan kalau hari ini bangsa Indonesia menepuk dada bahwa kami adalah champion di kawasan, karena kami bisa menyelesaikan sejumlah persoalan-persoalan yang sangat pelik dalam transisi ke demokrasi, dan sampai hari ini Indonesia bisa menjaga keutuhannya. Former President Suharto died 10 years ago at the age of 86 due to multiple organ failure. He will be remembered as Indonesia's father of development who brought economic growth during his 32 years in power. But it was a legacy that was marred by accusations of corruption and human rights abuses. Until his death in 2008, he was never convicted of any crime. Today, Indonesia is a full-fledged democracy, increasingly confident about its future. With 20 years of reformation, Indonesia cautiously and slowly shook itself free from its torturous past.